como les decía, estas conferencias son grabadas y en, en el término de pocos días están disponibles en la página web de Sinterford. Allí pueden encontrar la grabación de todas las videoconferencias que se han realizado. Ya veo también colegas Fernando, del Senati. Sí. Discúlpeme, ¿dónde puedo acceder a esas grabaciones? Porque es de mi en, plena interés. En la, eh, entras a la página web de Sinterford, en la parte superior está todo el canal de videoconferencias y puedes encontrar las anteriores y las futuras. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Muchas gracias. A ver, a ver, a ver. Eh... Si sí, ahí en la página oitesinterfor.org o usando el buscador nada más pones la palabra oitesinterfor y ahí te, te coloca en la página. Y en la parte superior derecha, un cuadrito amarillo dice inscripciones, videos, documentos, ciclo videoconferencias, 222. Pero ahí mismo encuentras las conferencias que ya se han realizado hacia atrás. Incluso las del año pasado están ahí también. Bueno, muy bien. Vamos a hacer honor a la hora y han pasado cinco minutos. Yo tengo el honor ahora, el gusto de verdad de presentarles a Eduarda Castel Branco. Eduarda es ya una querida colega para nosotros en, en esta región de América Latina y el Caribe. Ella es especialista senior en políticas y sistemas de educación técnica y formación profesional en la European Training Foundation, ¿no? la, la Fundación Europea sobre Formación. Y eh, la European Training Foundation, como ustedes saben, nos ha colaborado mucho en este tema conjunto del marco de cualificaciones. Está eh, con sede en Europa, en Turín. Ahora Eduarda nos está hablando también desde Bruselas. Eh, Eduarda tiene la amplia experiencia en el desarrollo de marcos de cualificaciones, como quiera que está trabajando actualmente en un proyecto junto con eh, el continente africano para desarrollar el, el marco de cualificaciones para ese continente. Y mucho de lo que ha aprendido allí, de las experiencias, ha tenido la gentileza y la generosidad de compartirlas con nosotros. Así que hoy vamos a tener el, la, la presentación de Eduarda, más en relación también con el tema de los resultados de aprendizaje. Entonces, por favor, eh, se ten su, su programa para el español traducido. Muchas gracias a Macarena, nuestra traductora, y a todo el equipo técnico de Sinterfor. Y Eduarda, tienes la palabra. Por favor, adelante. Uh, muchas gracias. Buenas tardes a todos. Es un gran placer para mí estar aquí de nuevo uh, con tantas, uh, tantos colegas de diferentes países de Latinoamérica. Yo no, portugués es mi, es mi idioma eh, y entonces mi español es siempre un poco portuñol, pero yo voy a hablar ahora en inglés y gracias por esta nueva oportunidad de, 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 de hablar, de, de aprender eh, en, con, con, con todos vos. Um, so, um, Thank you so much, Sinterfor. Thank you so much, uh, Fernando, Liliana, the team, for inviting me again. And this time, we are going to discuss about learning outcomes. And at the same time, we talk a little bit also about level descriptors. And um, this is all in the context of development of national and regional qualifications frameworks. As you can see on this first slide, uh, we are showing uh, the logo of African Continental Qualifications Framework, uh, which is the project uh, in which I am uh, working as a thematic coordinator. And this year, now in November, we will complete this first phase of the project. And uh, from first quarter 2023, we continue with a new project uh, moving into already implementation. And we hope to, to, to have the, the opportunity to continue sharing experiences with you, uh, with the Latin American different uh, experiences related with this important topic. And um, <clears throat> let us, let us uh, build something together uh, across different continents. Uh, 
so um, let us then um, start. I'd like just to show first a, few, a couple of sources and references. Uh, naturally, you will receive this uh, presentation and you can then access uh, the, this, the different sources. This is a topic um, that is quite central now uh, in many uh, national and regional qualifications frameworks across the, 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 across the world, simply. As you know, um, there are currently more or less 150 national qualifications frameworks in development and implementation in different stages. There are also a 17 uh, regional qualifications frameworks initiatives, also of different scope, different models. And the topic of learning outcome, learning outcomes is, is, is a crucial one. It's, it's one of the building blocks uh, of these new paradigms, let's say, of, of, of le le level, uh, level descriptors and an inclusive approach to learning and to acquisition of qualifications. So um, we will discuss a bit ab about learning, le learning outcomes mostly and a bit about level descriptors, which is a form of learning uh, outcomes. To learn more, you can use these different uh, sources here. Uh, in the ACQF project, we have developed 10 training modules, but we have also many other resources for training, for, 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 for sharing, for capacity development, which you can access use, download, view uh, on the ACQF website. So Terrain module one and two, as well as thematic brief number 10, they are all about, uh, about learning outcomes and level descriptors. There is also an orientation note on re regional qualifications framework of interest. And then CDFOP, which is an European Union agency specialized in vocational education and training, has issued these very, very interesting handbooks on learning outcomes. And you can also view the second edition, uh, which was uh, issued uh, just last year. Uh, very interesting and, and, and didactic for anyone interested. These are sources and references to which you can access. You can, when you have a moment, do, I think it, they, they are all um, quite universal, let's say, from the point of view also of examples and experiences they, uh, they explore. Let us look a bit at some defining, uh, defining concepts. Uh, talking about national qualifications frameworks, it's always important to try to have, let's say, a clarity about concepts, about different uh, notions. Uh, often it is the confusion <laughs> or the misinterpretation about certain terms and that creates uh, misunderstanding. So, um, in the ACQF project, we have created a poster <laughs> with all these different concepts. And in the middle, as you can see, we have this model of a uh, national qualifications framework seen uh, with a, from a systemic view. So the national qualifications framework not working in isolation, but together with all these pillars that you can, you can see from the institutional setting and stakeholders, qualification specifications and standards, a credit accumulation transfer system, qualifications databases, registers for transparency and information, quality assurance, validation or recognition of prior learning, non-formal informal learning, uh, monitoring and evaluation and research, communication outreach visibility to users, all together around the uh, NQF policy design document uh, in which naturally belong learning, uh, learning the, 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 the learning outcomes principle, the level descriptors, and, um, and, and, and other fundamental structures. So what are learning outcomes? And you can see on this uh, poster, and uh, it is also available on the, on the website, uh, all these key, uh, key uh, foundational definitions. So I just mentioned this systemic view uh, of of qualifications framework and uh, an ecosystem. So systemic view compared with an ecosystem where you have different elements that put together, linking the different dots, make this system uh, viable uh, and 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 feasible, sustainable as well. Um, I already described or briefly mentioned the various elements. And now I just wanted to show the place of learning outcomes in respect to all these different pillars 
or components of this ecosystem of qualifi national qualifications framework. And uh, so we see that, of course, the idea of learning outcomes is in the institutional setting and stakeholders. Stakeholders all expect level, the learning outcomes to meet certain goals. So it is part of the expectation of stakeholders. Then uh, naturally le learning outcomes are fundamental building blocks, concepts related with credit accumulation and transfer systems. Uh, nowadays, uh, these credit accumulation transfer systems are not only based on hours of learning, it's notional uh, time, notional uh, credit value, and also workload based on uh, learning uh, outcomes. Then, of course, learning outcomes are fundamental in qualifications databases and registers, and also in monitoring and evaluation and research monitoring and evaluation uh, net of qualifications frameworks naturally need to orient uh, the, the measurement and the indicators also to the status of achieved, expected versus achieved uh, learning outcomes in different contexts of a, of, a, of a qualification system. And we will see this right after. Of course, uh, learning outcomes are also present in the communication messaging outreach visibility to users. So um, the shift to learning outcomes approach needs to be well understood by users at all levels, the grassroots, teachers, their trainers, coaches, uh, enterprises, the learners themselves. Learning outcomes are fundamental for learners-centered approaches, uh, which are so important in national qualifications frameworks. So, so learning outcomes are also present in that, in that pillar. But now in red, where are learning outcomes ex especially important? Naturally in qualification specifications, qualification standards, in quality assurance of qualifications and provision. Naturally the, 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 the quality of qualifications depends very much on the way how learning outcomes are defined, formulated, taught, and assessed. Then in RPL, meaning validation, recognition of prior learning without learning outcomes, validation, recognition of prior learning is not possible because it is strictly oriented to, to, to outcomes, competences and skills acquired in life and work. And of course, learning outcomes at the core of the NQF policy. So national qualifications frameworks, as we know, they help to make qualifications easier to understand and compare. They can also encourage countries to rethink and reform national policy and practice on education, training, and lifelong learning. And as already said, learning outcomes are a fundamental principle at the core of this transformation. So national qualifications frameworks classify qualifications by level based on learning outcomes, which is basically what the holder of a certificate or diploma is expected to know, understand, and be able to do. So this classification reflects the content and profile of qualifications, and the learning outcomes approach ensures that education and training subsystems are open to one another. Besides, it also allows, of course, people to move more easily between education and training institutions and sectors, and they are essential for RPL. So what is a qualification? Just to recall, uh, it's a formal outcome of an assessment and validation process, which is obtained when the competent authority determines that an individual has achieved learning outcomes to given standards. So learning outcomes at the core of definition of a qualification. So, Another way of defining is a qualification is a specification of learning outcomes that is approved by an authority accrediting body as meeting the requirements of the NQF. And this is just an example of a certificate and also the list of learning outcomes attached to this certificate. And this is a very important element of transparency for the holder of this qualification. Um, qualifications are between, between the world of employment, of employment activities of different types, 
self-employment as well, and the world of skills development, education, initial training, lifelong learning. And so qualifications are the result of these two uh, uh, driving forces. And to develop qualifications, to teach and le leading to qualifications, to assess qualifications, it's important to have information on demand in the labor market, various types of information, more or less gradual, gr granular, detailed. It's important to develop the professional standards, the qualification standards, to develop the training programs, meeting the requirements of these qualification standards, to deliver training, to assess and certify, and naturally also to monitor and evaluate the performance. So this is a cycle. Again, you can say a sort of an ecosystem. And learning outcomes are fundamental in all these different elements. So what are learning outcomes? Uh, here we have three main words. It is to know, it is to understand, and it is also to do. It is what a learner is expected to know, to be able to do and understand at the end of a certain learning process. And learning is not only schooling in an institution, it can also be learning by doing on the job, as it happens so with all of us, by the way. Um, we learn more <laughs> in, a no, in our non-formal uh, ways uh, through and informal ways day to day uh, than in the university and initial training. So the move towards a learning outcomes approach presents a shift from the question, what did the graduate or the learner do or study to get this qualification? And the shift to the question, what can the graduate do now that he or she has this qualification? So looking at learning outcomes as an ecosystem, um, and um, there is also an idea <laughs> that I heard in a conference very recently that learning outcomes can also be seen as the GPS of the qualification system, GPS, showing, showing the road, showing the way, and showing different ways, by the way. So learning outcomes as structure, learning outcomes as guide for coherence, and learning outcomes for quality assurance. So a structure as building blocks, blocks of qualifications policy, as common currency that enhances transparency, common currency that, that can be understood, can be compared, can be exchanged. Then as guide for coherence, learning outcomes very important in the classification of qualifications in the national qualifications framework or system. Um, in, in, in the learning outcomes statements, statements, competency statements, teaching and learning, of course, curriculum modules in assessment and certification, and in quality assurance. So allowing through the feedback loop, the continuous improvement between the expected learning outcome and the achieved learning outcome. So learning outcomes are applied in uh, many different uh, contexts, different ways, as a common language for describing and comparing qualifications, uh, providing understanding of what will be learned and how to best achieve it, uh, setting even expectations, guide teaching and learning is for, for assessment to enable, as already said, this learner-centered approach. So learners can, let's say, are empowered. It is clearer for them about the learning expectations, in, encouraging them to take initiative and, in, and responsibility for own learning. And promoting personal achievement, mobility and recognition. So achievement through formal, non-formal and informal pathways of the assessed learning uh, outcomes. These signals that an individual has achieved uh, certain outcomes that can culminate in a qualification award. It supports credit systems, allows stakeholders to have a better understanding of what to expect from a qualification holder. And finally, allow evaluation and comparison of qualification for work and study purposes for mobility, for portability, local and international. Uh, it's quite important to always bear in mind 
the relationship that needs to be considered uh, between the expected learning outcome, which is what is planned in the qualification or in the training program, in the curriculum, in the module, and the achieved learning outcome, which is uh, what the uh, individual has really acquired and has demonstrated through, uh, through, through, through assessment uh, uh, at completion of a learning process. And this feedback loop is important to con constantly improve the expected and also the achieved learning outcomes. So the desired, the relationship between the desired target and the obtained uh, learning a cycle of continuous improvement. So again, this is another view of this cycle of continuous improvement around the notion or learning outcomes as a tool also for to guide and measure the continuous improvement. Um, so let us also take a look at level descriptors, level descriptors. It is one of the forms of learning outcomes. So um, what are level descriptors? This is a very important uh, fundamental structure of a national or regional qualifications framework. So they are statements describing learning achievement at a particular level of a qualifications framework. And it provides a broad indication of the types of learning outcomes and assessment criteria that are appropriate to a qualification at that level. So this means uh, that um, the level descriptor naturally is always formulated in a more generic manner than the le level descriptor that then the learning outcomes of a specific qualification or of a module of a training module or or of assessment criteria and that's uh, something always to bear in mind there is a difference in the design formulation level of granularity of detail of level of, of learning outcomes in different contexts. And it's also important since we are in the context of a regional qualifications framework uh, in development to, to compare a little bit what are level descriptors at national level and what are level descriptors at regional level. There are similarities, but there are also differences. As you can imagine, the level descriptors of a national qualifications framework are always more detailed because they take into account the national context, whereas the regional qualifications framework must have level uh, level descriptors that are a bit more generic because they have to be applicable, let's say, understood by all countries of the region. So in an NQF, a level descriptors are at the heart of development of qualifications frameworks. Of course, they are formulated as general learning outcome statements that signal transparency are suited to a particular purpose. They are an agreed central reference point and multi-stakeholder platform for dialogue. They are basic on a longer vertical and horizontal dimension. Very similar features also in, uh, in the RQFs. Uh, where, of course, the logic vertical and horizontal uh, of uh, increasing a degree or level of complexity is very fundamental in an RQF because RQFs exist exactly to create referencing, to create correspondence between different national qualifications frameworks. So, so these concepts are quite similar between the two. Uh, only with the difference that, of course, the level descriptors uh, in RQFs are more generic. Of another, uh, so they, the, 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 in an RQF, um, uh, they, they support uh, the, the NQF development also, and they promote um, learning outcomes based approaches in the regional block because RQFs act as catalysts for development at national level as well. So Differences uh, the, and in NQF level descriptors, as already said, we have a much more detailed and complex formulation, uh, whereas in RQFs, the level descriptors, which are learning outcomes, they serve purposes complementary to those of the national qualifications framework. So they are a basis for referencing levels of NQFs or systems to the RQF. They are orientation for countries or regions in developing their qualifications frameworks or systems. They guide, they can guide, they can inspire. They are an orientation towards minimum, uh, common minimum benchmarks for learning 
uh, outcomes on the regional uh, block. They can serve serve a little bit as benchmarks. They are they, as level descriptors. They signify the levels of learning complexity at regional level. Let's say aspired for the regional level. But of course, they do not capture, and they are not supposed to capture the same complexities, details, and and contexts that are that are proper, that are uh, uh, evident in the national level descriptors. So these are complementary complementary notions. So we said about learning outcomes in different contexts, and we already said that they 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 are formulated differently. So learning outcomes, they can be a reform tool. They appear uh, in the NQF, RQF level descriptors. They appear, they are part, they are fundamental in the standards of qualifications, in training standards and, and programs, curricula, in assessment criteria, in uh, recognition of prior learning, validation of non-formal informal learning, in qualifications documents and credentials like diploma supplements, uh, in micro credentials, in databases and registers of qualifications. And as you can imagine, uh, this the formulation of, of such lear of learning outcomes in such different uh, contexts is also differentiated. It, it can be more specific uh, in one context rather than in the other. In education and training, just as examples, we see here also a very long list of applications of learning uh, uh, outcomes. So, um, and some of them have already been, been listed. Uh, in addition, for example, we know they are, learning outcomes are also important, for example, in career guidance and in evaluation of foreign qualifications. In at work, we also see the, the, the role, the place of learning outcomes formulated differently, more oriented to tasks, maybe in skills, competencies, and in occupational and professional standards, in recruitment and job vacancies, we can see also in matching job seekers uh, curricula uh, with job vacancies, texts and requirements of job vacancies, in uh, job descriptions, in performance appraisals of, 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 of staff of enterprises, in uh, classifications and taxonomies of occupations and skills in ISCO, ESCO, ONET, and then at personal level in this description of experience in RPL, uh, portfolios, portfolios of experience, etc. So learning outcomes are a little bit present in all these different domains. Um, and we are dealing with learning outcomes on a daily basis, even without knowing it. Uh, if we had time, we could have chatted a little bit. Uh, your views, what can be other uses that you know? If you want to include a couple of words or ideas in the chat box in, in Spanish as well. And these are very interesting studies, um, analytical studies, is taking a very interesting historic uh, overview uh, of how uh, learning outcomes have contributed to reforms, have been part of the reform of vocational education and training, for example, in Europe. That's just an example. Uh, another example of learning outcomes in uh, reforms of vocational education and training are, for, are, for example, this approach par competence, competence-based training in a number of African countries. They are all listed here. Uh, currently, the ACQF project is also doing uh, a new simplified and smart, let's say, handbook on competence-based training uh, for, for, for VET, for TVET in Africa. It includes also a, sh a short study of state of play of these reforms uh, of competence-based training. Yes, let us look very quickly at uh, some principles for writing learning outcomes statements. Naturally, that this is all very simplified here. Uh, these are exercises that require you to take time to reflect very well uh, on the linkages of learning outcomes with the labor market and, and, and task uh, aspects or side, and then the occupation, the, the, the training and qualification side of, of the qualification. So um, I'm just very, I'm, I'm presenting here very simplified views on how learning outcome statements, statements can be formulated in a in a way that is clear and more or less harmonized. So learning outcome statements are in principle action verb driven. 
and they are learner-centered actions. It's about what the learner is supposed to, to know, understand, and do. So it should start with an action verb, such as, for example, organize, followed by an object of, of that verb, such as, for example, organize a, an administrative process, and followed by a phrase that provides the context. And the context is very important. For example, for presentation to public entities. An example, organize administrative processes for presentation to public entities. That's a learning outcome uh, coming from a, a qualification in the domain, maybe of accounting, for example. An important tip, um, it's, it's good to work backwards from what the learner is, require, is required to achieve. So let's say backward from the outcome, from the end. For, each, for every verb-driven learning outcome statement, teaching, learning activities, and different examples of assessments could then flow logically from the verb, from the action verb of the statement. It's also good to, take, to bear in mind the need to be uh, clear, to, 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 to have priorities well set in terms of what has to be included in the learning outcomes formulations. Avoid very complicated sentences, of course, that simply kill the learning outcome because then it's not measurable or not understood and in the same way by everybody. And um, may, of course, learning outcomes descriptions must be fit for purpose. They must suit the context. For example, the level descriptors of the qualification or, uh, a, at, at which the qualification aims to be in the framework, the qualification standard, curricular assessment, uh, and must be achievable. There are several examples in this presentation of use of learning outcomes in different contexts, such as, for example, um, in subject benchmark statements. And here there is the example of QAA um, of in, 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 the, in the UK. So you can also uh, take a look at, at, this, um, um, at this link, at this documentation. So learning outcome statements in the context of subject, subject benchmark statements uh, make explicit the nature of study, the general subject specific academic features and standards expected of graduates in specific subject areas and what they are expected to know at the end of their study. So you can consult the, this documentation. These are just examples. Another example is tuning and de degree profiles. Um, uh, the, the Tuning Africa project has developed degree program profiles with identified learning outcomes and blocks of competences that need to be achieved in order to obtain the degree in different areas. And there is also quite a lot of information, uh, handbooks, many examples that you can as well consult and try to learn from that. I think that Latin America has also been involved in these tuning uh, projects. Currently in, in the European Union, there is an ongoing uh, project um, looking at development of a guidelines, methodology, pra pragmatic methodology for uh, definition, description, and writing short learning outcomes-based descriptions of qualifications. And um, so this project has, has just developed the first draft of these guidelines. Today, in the morning, there was a long discussion about this first draft. So what I'm sharing with you is just from that first draft. It's not complete, but when we have the final version, I will gladly share it with you. It can be very helpful for everybody. So the purpose is to have short descriptions of qualifications to help readers of all camps, learners, employers, teachers, etc., to better and grasp the content and level of learning required to attain a qualification, and allowing them to, to judge the relevance for further learning and for employment. So very often, as we know, qualifications are described with either long texts or long lists of bullet points with all the learning outcomes. So the point, the idea here is to come to uh, the possibility of, besides the long detailed formulations, to have also the more or less harmonized approach to, to write shorter uh, formulations to, to help readers, users, understand the qualifications and use them. So this methodology, um, if I can call like that, this guideline is based on six main building blocks. And the building blocks are the following, the length of the description. So the number 
uh, of, of, of words uh, in, in the description. The syntax of the description of the learning out, of, of, the, of the learning outcomes based qualification, the overall objective on, and orientation of the qualification, the context, as I already mentioned before, in which the qualification opter operates, this makes a big difference to know the context and express it. The breadth of learning required, which is the horizontal dimension of the qualification and the, and the depth, which is the vertical. Um, and so also here in the presentation, I, I, will, I cannot go into all the details, but um, you can also take a look. And if you have questions, please do address to Fernando, Liliana, and uh, I can gladly respond to questions in the next opportunity. So um, length, uh, and, and syntax are important to ensure the use and comparability of, uh, of, of, of the description. And they cannot stand alone. They must be seen together. Length, syntax, and objective. Uh, this context, breadth, and depth uh, also need to be seen um, uh, in conjunction. They, they are presented separately, but in fact, they need to be conceived in conjunction. And this is the graph, uh, the graphic representation of this conceptual model, let's say, where you have the overall objective uh, and orientation of the qualification. So introduction to graphs, the main aim of the qualification for labor market, societal learning purposes. Then you have the context, the big context, uh, and then the breadth uh, what skills, knowledge, competences of the qualification and the depth are related. So uh, you, we see here, I think very clearly, like say the linkages between these six uh, elements in two groups, if we can say. And then as you see, there is there a, a recommendation about trying to limit the length of the formulation to maximum uh, 1,500 uh, words. So trying to be very efficient in the description. There are, uh, of course, more, um, more guidelines and a number of guiding questions about each one of these, of these, um, of these elements. Uh, here in this presentation, uh, also some example of basic structure of learning outcome statements. Um, I think um, this, 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 this table, for example, is yeah. quite simple and uh, I'm not going into detail. There are some guiding questions, as you can see. Um, let me just address very, very quickly. I think I will take, let's say, not more than five minutes to finish. Um, so some issues when talking and discussing about learning outcomes and the shift to learning outcomes. There, there are concerns, there are critical remarks by analysts, etc., about the idea that learning outcomes, the use of learning outcomes can dump down, can dump down education and the ambition of, of education to, to, to educate, to, to develop a, a personality, a person, a, a citizen. Um, so for, and this is related to the fact that sometimes learning outcomes are too detailed, too prescriptive statements, and therefore they can create this idea that they dump down the learning and the assessment process. Learning cannot be so uh, limited in a strict um, but this, and there are also contradictions and tensions between schools of thought, as you know, behavioristic tradition and constructivist approach. The behavioristic tradition emphasizes very much clearly observable and a measurable learning outcomes. And the constructivist approach is more looking at, at the process-oriented, open-ended uh, uh, learning. And therefore, learning outcomes will be formulated differently according to these two, let's say, approaches. So there should be a balanced way to deal with both of them ways to address these issues. So, and these are again, um, recommendations out of the experience in, in the EU and other countries. And you can have much more information on this in those various sources that I have indicated in the beginning. Ways to address them. Learning outcomes written as threshold statements do not prevent learners to go beyond these minimum expectations. No, so learning outcomes should not prevent 
the the, the learning path and the learning uh, uh, the learning uh, aspirations. Learning outcomes need to be defined and written in a way which allows for local adaptation and interpretation by teachers, tutors, trainers, and learners. Learning outcomes should, should assist teachers in identifying and combining teaching methods. So they should orient a learning process. They should not restrict it. And, and of course, uh, it's important always for developers of qualifications and training programs, curricula uh, modules, to find the right balance between prescriptive and descriptive learning outcomes. So two prescriptive can, can lead to dumping down and ensure, of course, that learning outcomes are fit for the purpose and the context. Um, so the, this, uh, this slide goes a little bit more into detail about how to ease the application of level descriptors so, um, and, and also the, and the, and the learning outcomes. Some examples from concrete qualifications, and I'm bringing here uh, four um, qualifications taken from the official online registers of qualifications of these four African countries. Uh, they are all from different um, regions, um, Botswana, Cape Verde, Mozambique, South Africa, <clears throat> different languages as well, different education and training traditions. But I will refer mainly to one because of, of our limited time um, availability. So uh, as said, you can consult, by the way, these registers. You can just click in those hyperlinks and you, you, you will go and you can find very, very interesting information and details about all the qualifications that are registered. And I'm going to take to talk mostly about Cape Verde. Cape Verde is halfway, as you can see, to the American continent. So that's the right, the right uh, country to, to use as an example here in this talk today. So um, in this case, um, uh, Cape Verde is an, has an NQF of eight levels. And we are looking here at level five. So um, the, 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 uh, the Cape Verde NQF has level descriptors uh, formulated in, in, in three domains of learning, uh, knowledge, skills, responsibility, and autonomy. And as you can see, this is the formulation, this is the description of the domain responsibility and autonomy. It's only one domain of the level five of the Cape Verde National Qualifications Framework. So level five is, let's say, if we look in terms of education, it is like post-secondary education. So those, those qualifications normally are of professional orientation. Uh, and you can see uh, how the, the, the statements defining this level five of the Cape Verde NQF in the domain responsibility and autonomy. Now, what I wanted to show here is just the correspondence between those rules about formulation of learning outcomes that I have described quickly earlier and the way how this uh, disqualification is described. And it's a concrete, a real qualification. Uh, it is accounting management level five of the Cape Verde NQF. So remember, we spoke about the broad, short description of the qualification. It is there. So now let us just use arrows and I will click and you will see the correspondence between. In blue, you have now table 16, right? Principles supporting the presentation of learning outcomes on one side. And on the other side, in, in green, you have the description of this qualification. Let us find whether the developers of this qualification have had in mind those principles to develop the learning outcomes of the qualification. So let us start. Um, what do we see? The learning outcomes description should be between 500 and 1,500 characters and be written considering tak, tak, tak. So do we see that? Yes. We see that the short description corresponds to this, um, to this initial, initial, um, uh, initial cat uh, category or, or feature. It should be present. He should present the, the qualification from perspective of the learner and what he, she is presented to know, be able to do and understand. So the broad description of the qualification is carry out accounting, tax, financial uh, control management, et cetera, et cetera. So it is from the point of view of the learner. 
Then another characteristic. What is the, 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 from the guide, what do we see? We see it should use action verbs to signal the level of learning expected, normally with an explicit or implicit reference to the levels of national qualifications framework. And here we see the units of competency of this qualification are all formulated, described with uh, action verbs, carry out accounting and tax management, carry out financial management, organize administrative uh, processes, handle office computer applications, and so on. So the action verbs, that's one additional. Let's look at the third feature. It should indicate the object and scope of the expected learning outcomes. So the object and the scope, this description should capture the main orientation of the qualification and the breadth, depth of the expected accomplishment. Uh, it can, if deemed appropriate, use domains, domains, as defined in the NPF. And here we see uh, the, 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 the scope, uh, processes, administrative processes for presentation to public entities. Let's see another characteristic, which is uh, the, uh, um, a reference, an indication to the level of the framework. It's also uh, indicated there, broad definition of the qualification, um, it's indicated so the, uh, in terms of the unit of competency. And what else? Um, we, um, the, the summary. So the, um, the, the, the correspondence here between the example on the summary of the qualification in the, ex, in, in the guide in blue, as well as uh, the concrete example of this qualification of level five from Cape Verde. So this, this is just to show a correspondence in terms of example and the correspondence between the guide, the handbook uh, on presenting um, learning outcomes and a concrete uh, qualification. Um, so let us move on and just, I, I, will, be, I will finish very quick, quickly. So um, that, that's just to give an, an impression, I'm sure you understand because this is in Portuguese. Um, Cape Verde Accounting Management Level 5, yes? So we see one document here called uh, Perfil Profissional, the professional profile, uh, with the, the key units of competence, and uh, then another document, which is a complement to the Perfil Profissional, to the professional profile, and that's the training program of this professional qualification. And it is entirely based on the units of competence, that have been defined in the professional uh, profile. And as you know, these units of competence are themselves defined, described very shortly uh, as learning outcomes themselves. All the other examples are very interesting. You can go and see different uh, models of presenting qualifications and, and, and level descriptors. Uh, just allow me to say, this is an example of Botswana. You can see all qualifications in that register are, are structured in the similar, in a similar template, similar structure. And very interesting, you can see here on the page two, we have in one column, we have the profile, the learning outcomes for the graduates, yes? Communicate effectively, demonstrate the skills in preparing budget for tourism management events. And on the second column, we have the assessment criteria that are recommended for each one to assess each one of these learning outcomes. The assessment criteria too are of course formulated as learning outcomes, but much more detailed granular so that they can really guide assessment process. That was just um, the, the, the idea. So I just wanted here to signal this very interesting here combination of two different uh, levels of granularity of learning outcomes. One are the general learning outcomes of the qualification in the first column, and the second are the linked assessment criteria, much more granular formulation of learning outcomes. All the others you can, of course, look through, uh, and also please uh, visit all those websites. Um, I will finish just one minute to say Again, as already said in the beginning, um, we are in a world in total and quick 
transformation driven by a multi a multiple set a cumul accumulation of mega drivers of change, as we know, so that uh, lifelong learning is a must. It must be present in our daily life, our paradigms, uh, from highest politics to the grassroots. And recognition of prior learning is one of the elements of, uh, of course, lifelong learning. Actually, we say uh, recognition of prior learning gives us wings to jump over, over gaps and especially also to, to also to, um, uh, let's say, to make visible all the invisible skills and competences that we acquire throughout, throughout life. And here I will just look, and this is to finalize the presentation, at the connection between uh, learning outcomes, national qualifications framework, and recognition of prior learning. So, um, as always, this is a scheme. Let us just very briefly reflect about it. The NQF is always based on these four big pillars, qualification standards, which are, of course, themselves outcomes assessment based on qualification standards and outcomes, not on schooling, no, not on years, number of years of study in a school, but on the outcomes, parity of value of certificates, meaning parity of esteem of certificates obtained by formal training and also by and formal assessment of formal training and by recognition of prior learning and quality assurance. And so RPL is, is, is intrinsically linked, determined, and defined by these principles and by these mechanisms as well. So a base uh, assessment is based on qualification standards, uh, based on learning outcomes, on parity of value of certificates. So the learners, the, the, the candidates to RPL, to validation of non-formal informal learning need to have access to an, an equi equitable treatment in the qualification system and the quality assurance, which gives credibility to the entire process of recognition, as well as to the final outcome. That is a person with recognized skills from a lifelong uh, story of work and effort and struggle, and a person who can now have access to decent work or to further education and training. So. That's um, that's uh, that's that's the final chat, the final <laughs> final slide. And here I have just a, a question for the chat box or for your conversations further on with your colleagues as well. And and that's the final slide. So learning outcomes are the GPS in the ecosystem of qualifications. What do you think about this? Do you agree? Why? Any comments? So if you want to chat about this with colleagues uh, or, or with the colleagues um, in, 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 in the Center for um, setting uh, could be also interesting. And, and send us, send me your views about this statement. It's a statement I heard very recently uh, from a representative of the, of the Committee of Regions of the European Union, who was reflecting about the importance of learning outcomes as GPS in the ecosystem of qualifications. I think I finished, uh, Fernando, Liliana. I hope I, it was not too long. Thank you. Gracias, Eduarda. Muchísimas gracias. Ha sido realmente una, una amplísima revisión de, de todos los conceptos y experiencias que, que has podido trabajar en, en esta, eh, no solo en África, pero también en el trabajo que has hecho en otros países de, de Europa. Yo creo que hay dos hallazgos para cerrar un poco lo que decías, este hallazgo de que pueden ser los resultados de aprendizaje un GPS, como decimos en nuestra región, no un GPS para la eh, organización de las cualificaciones, pero también creo que has, has enfatizado mucho en el mismo concepto de, de resultados de aprendizaje, que para nosotros es un un énfasis grande en esta movida desde los sistemas tradicionales hacia los marcos de cualificaciones. Han mostrado varios ejemplos y hemos tenido varias preguntas también de, de, de los participantes. Hay, hay una primera justamente de Liliana que, que, que se refiere a, a que cuando hemos usado verbos en otros momentos para re, redactar eh, 
por ejemplo, normas de competencia, se ha utilizado a veces alguna taxonomía, como la taxonomía sí. de Bloom, ¿no? Eh, ¿Cómo ves esto? ¿Se pueden tener en cuenta estas taxonomías ahora también para redactar resultados de aprendizaje? Sí. ¿Me um, <risa> puedo hablar en inglés? inglés? por favor. Sí, sí. sí. Okay. Muy bien. Yes. Um, porque mi portuñol no es muy bueno. Uh, <risa> Entonces... Um, Sí, hay muchas, hay diversas taxonomías. Right? Uh, there are different taxonomies that can be used. So one is, of course, the Bloom taxonomy, but also the follow-up uh, taxonomies uh, related also with uh, levels of, of, of learning, understanding, interpretation, uh, mastery. So these taxonomies uh, have evolved and they are very good uh, and helpful for the... Um, design of, um, uh, of, 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 of learning outcomes and conceptualization also of the levels of learning, um, that, that's their role. But I would say that there are also other taxonomies, maybe a bit more instrumental and related with uh, labor market terms that are very useful, including um, ISCO, uh, so the, the, the descriptions of occupations, um, and also taxonomies, these new taxonomies of skills. For example, in the European Union, there is ESCO, which is uh, European Skills, Competences and Qualifications. It contains two main pillars. One is um, a taxonomy of occupations, which is based on ESCO. And another one is an, a new taxonomy of skills with an hierarchy. There is also uh, ONET, uh, ONET in, in, in the US, And now the two, these two taxonomies, ESCO skills and ONET skills have, uh, have, a, have a crosswalk, meaning a, um, a methodology for, to, to correspond one to the other. I think those taxonomies of skills are also very uh, useful in the formulation of learning outcomes. So that I would say that for teams, experts or working uh, on, on, on defining Uh, defining, conceptualizing, writing, learning outcomes, they can use both. They can use uh, Bloom and they can for the levels of learning and learning complexity. And they can also use these skills taxonomies that are, uh, that are more technical in terms of the content uh, of, of, of skills, content and description of skills. And all this is online. You can download, there are, you can download, you can use, you can also send questions if you want to use this, tax, for example, ESCO skills. If you are interested, uh, I can send mm -hmm. you contact. Now, other questions? Sí, okay. acabamos de compartir, acabamos de compartir en el chat eh, el sitio web de ESCO, también yeah. de ONET, que es usado. Y uh -huh. Muchas gracias por tu recomendación también con las diferentes taxonomías más cercanas a, a, al mercado de trabajo. Uh -huh. Hay países que han trabajado taxonomías. En Brasil se ha hecho también un, un trabajo de taxonomías y de verbos más usados. Eh, y va a haber bastante para, para, para digamos, consultar. ¿no? Hay uh -huh. algunas otras preguntas. Eh, bueno, a, a alguna participante preguntaba documentos base para, para consultar. Creo que hay uno de CDFOP que ya Liliana compartió, que es este manual sobre sí. eh, redacción y elaboración de resultados de aprendizaje. Eh, pero también les recomiendo mucho que vean los enlaces eh, que nos ha dejado Eduardo. Ha dejado una buena cantidad de enlaces. La forma en que están redactados, por ejemplo, los, los resultados de aprendizaje y las cualificaciones en Cabo Verde, en Botsuana, en otros países, nos pueden ayudar. A propósito, hay muchos parecidos. Los, los colegas de muchas instituciones habrán visto que hay muchos parecidos con lo que se está haciendo, pero es bueno también ver qué cosas han cambiado, porque como dice Eduarda, esto ha cambiado, esto cambia muy rápido, ¿no? Cambia sí. muy rápido. ¿Hay, ¿Hay alguna pregunta detallada de Paraguay que están usando cinco niveles? Bueno, sé que también Chile usa cinco niveles, pero por cuestiones de limitar hasta la educación técnico-profesional. ¿Tú tienes alguna recomendación del número... Digamos, si hubiera un número ideal de niveles, ¿cuál sería? O, sí, sí. o si trabajar ocho niveles. Sí, muchas gracias. Um, so let me say, um, it depends on the purpose of the country, on the priority of the country or the region as well. So if 
Paraguay is as now five le levels, I guess these are this is a framework more for professional, vocational education and training, I guess. If you want to have a comprehensive inclusive framework that covers the entirety of the continuum of education and training, then you will go up to eight levels or even 10 levels. For example, in Africa, uh, the many countries have 10 levels. But there are also seven levels and eight levels. In Europe, the majority, large majority, have eight levels, uh, comprising from basic uh, education certificates to, to PhD doctoral certificates. Um, so th th that's that's a, de a decision of the country. Some countries, and I've seen this happen in, a lot in Africa, start with a sectoral partial framework. Usually it is vocational education and training. And then they go on to expand it, to make it to comprehensive to, to include higher education, post-secondary education, etc. So it's a decision that you, you can take um, de depend. And now when you are dealing with the entirety of the education and training continuum, the governance of the framework is also different because you need to sit around the table and dialogue uh, all subsectors of education, it's not always easy. You, you know that uh, the higher education, the, the vocational education, uh, basic education, adult education, etc. They must be able to speak together a common language and find themselves and find their place in that comprehensive framework. But it is the, the way forward. Uh, the large, large majority of those 150 national qualifications frameworks that I mentioned, uh, according to the inventory of national and regional qualifications frameworks, are, are comprehensive. So they are not only par par partial. Um, I may, may I just add one small thing, Emilia? Um, so um, I want to say, Emilia, uh, there are countries in Africa, for example, that have a framework of eight levels, and it is fully professional. It's not for academic, let's say, qualifications, but it is eight levels, which is an interesting perspective. It means professional, vocational education, also at higher levels of the continuum, education and training continuum. And so this is a bit of a different issue that I am, um, I am raising here. So the framework can be of eight levels and cover uniquely the professional qualifications. M more questions? Eduardo? Sí, Liliana, por favor, tenías alguna pregunta también? Sí, eh, me excuso por no encender la cámara. Bueno, Eduardo, quisiera contarte que quizá en América Latina en OIT es Interpol hemos identificado que hay seis países que tienen marcos de cualificaciones, tres de los cuales ya tienen cualificaciones pero hay otros países que no tienen cualificaciones o todavía no tienen sus marcos. Entonces tú en esos casos, ¿qué sugerirías como referentes para diseñar programas de formación sin tener resultados de aprendizaje por, que provengan de las cualificaciones? Uh -huh. Ok. Um, thanks for this question, Liliana. So, um, since you are in... Let me let me re, uh, give you a, a more, let's say a sort of a, a sociological response, not a technical one. What I would say is that you, since you are a region and you have Center for kind of facilitating and supporting these developments, um, you have lots of commonalities, including language, etc. Um, those countries that have already concrete experiences. Uh, they have expertise, they have qualifications based on learning outcomes, they have, um, let's say, quite a good clarity related to the levels, uh, breadth and depth, uh, vertical, horizontal um, logic. Um, they can serve in a way as, as, as um, lighthouses, in, you see, um, for, for the other countries. Uh, learning with each other. That's that's what I say, the sociological, let's say, response. And that's the, that's a, I, in my view, a very pragmatic and efficient way of doing. So learning with each other. And learning with each other is not about copying. 
because you learn and then you contextualize in any case to your own needs to to your own uh, system that there is another another thing i want to say liliana in principle there is no country that has no qualification system in some form they have an implicit not explicit but an implicit framework or system they have their let's say more or less let me say traditional levels descriptions of qualifications types of qualifications by levels it is not they might not be of course structured uh, as we know this modern type of qualifications frameworks but they do serve a purpose they are what we say implicit and they will become explicit when they will move a step forward to reflect again on objectives, principles, a structure of levels with level descriptors, and start thinking about the qualifications based on learning outcomes. So this is all work for, for some years, yes? So, and it can all be done step by step by phases. Um, so that's, that's the, I, I want to say is that countries need to build on what they have, their context, and, and, and move, a step forward and they can learn with each other in a region with so much of common uh common values and cultural features let's say if if i'm not i think that's uh, so the, the technical and the sociological side of of the of these things um Excellent. so um there there's you know in in the i want just to give an example um a country small country interesting very dynamic in europe luxembourg they they have a national qualifications framework they realized uh, they they have the national qualifications framework they have qualifications but they are not formulated in learning outcomes they are some sort of a traditional formulation based very much on inputs not on outcomes and they decided yes we have to do something about this if we have a framework of a qualifications framework, we must have now qualifications in learning outcomes so that we can find the correspondence with the framework and the levels. So they took a very, a very kind of ambitious decision to work on their qualifications and review, revise, reconstruct them. So that's that's something that takes time, takes a champion, takes a, a strong political will takes takes um, a group of people who are engaged with stakeholders with professional sectors etc and move this this thing forward um yeah okay <laughs> gracias eduarda muy muy bien es 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 claro que estamos hablando de una transición entre sistemas tradicionales no basados en inputs, como dices tú, o en contenidos, a algo que nos acerque a sistemas basados en resultados de aprendizaje. Algunos países en la región han trabajado mucho en los últimos años con el modelo de eh, normas o estándares de competencia laboral. Eh, y ahora eh, hay un participante justamente que nos dice que los resultados de aprendizaje son la base para elaborar cualificaciones pero que también complementan con normas de competencia laboral. Sí. Incluso la, la forma en que una norma de competencia, eh, las que eran muy usadas en el sistema inglés, se redactan, son, tienen muchos parecidos, ¿no? El criterio de desempeño, el verbo, el objeto, la condición, etc. ¿Cómo es esa transición en tu experiencia, Eduarda? Hay que pasar a la cualificación, al resultado de aprendizaje y de ahí derivar el estándar de competencia o es un loop donde se alimentan los dos? Um, bueno, um, I, it depends, I would say, on the, on the context on the, of the country, also on the, on the place and role of qualifications uh, in that specific uh, country context. But um, I would say that it is more of a loop, an interactive uh, process, where one uh, feeds into the other. Um, it also depends on the governance in the country. Imagine a country with a very strong role of employers, a confederation of employers with a very strong uh, 
capacity, uh, political will behind them, and they want to move ahead with uh, this reform in certain sectors that are priority for the employment or investments in the country. So they, there could be there um, a situation where, where the occupational uh, standards or, or standards of competence take the lead, take the leading role and the qualification standards follow. Um, there, there are also different uh, way, there are different positions on this, on this inter, inter, in, in, uh, interrelation between occupational standards and qualifications. Uh, some countries say they do not really want to fully derive their qualification standards from occupational standards. There is more to the qualification than the qualification, than the occupational standard. But in principle, there is um, a, a very clear relationship, more or less accepted in general terms between one and, and the other. But we always need to bear in mind the qualification is broader, is bro should be able to provide learners with some flexibility and some broad band uh, of skills, knowledge, skills, and competences so that the learner, the graduate, the holder of the qualification is not stuck, let's say, in a narrow only occupation and without flexibility, adaptability, etc. So it is uh, also a matter of policy of the, of, of the country for inclusion, lifelong learning, etc. And also depends on the type of labor market. Imagine labor markets that are very regulated and those that are totally free irregulated. Uh, in certain labor markets, the uh, the, the relationship between qualification and occupation is quite loose. In others, it is imperative to have an, a, a, an, an adequate, adequate qualification to enter in certain professions or in many professions. So it's also a matter of the culture, let's say, of the labor market, more or less regulated. This also determines this relationship between the occupation and then the employment in certain in in in, in many occupations. Um, okay, okay. So creo that's que, why the context is important. And yeah, sí, creo que palabras clave: contexto, flexibilidad, análisis. Sí. Also, because you sí. don't want to, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to limit. A sit the citizens in their choices throughout life. So the qualifications need to be broader in terms of the sets of knowledge, skills, and competences than the occupational standard. Exacto. Eh, Liliana, tú tenías otra pregunta también. Eh, sí, Eduarda, eh, hay un interés creciente y los mismos empresarios, el sector productivo, resaltan hoy por hoy todo lo que se incluye en las competencias transversales o blandas o socioemocionales. Eh, ¿Cómo sugieres tú abordar estos resultados de aprendizaje sobre ese tipo de, de competencias eh, transversales? Let's see. Uh, this is really a very, very important question. And absolutely true. Uh, surveys and studies about uh, employers' needs uh, show in many places, not, not only in Europe or in Asia also, but everywhere, that they really are, give a, a huge importance nowadays to transversal skills. And um, what we also see, and this is just a small parenthesis, uh, Liliana, is something else which is called hybrid skills, where uh, the 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 the, the, the 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 occupation the job is requiring a combination of technical a very often very specific technical skills high level with skills from very different areas uh, marketing and uh, data science and, and so on so these hybrid skills so what to do about this then in 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 the qualification uh, standard or in the learning outcomes but your question about transversal skills, let me also add something, a small parenthesis. 
before, before going to concretely to your, your point. Um, I, I, can, um, I can share with you after this, I will send it to you, of course, Liliana and Fernando, a couple of uh, links that, that give some substance to all these discussions. Notably, uh, an, an interesting uh, work that is being done now in the European Qualifications Framework context and also ESCO about what is called um, uh, transversal skills and competences. So it's not called transversal skills only, but transversal skills and competences. And there is a model, uh, a concept model created with uh, with the necessary linkages uh, between the different parts, aspects of the model, the structure, uh, a sort of hierarchy even of transversal skills. And this has been then also translated into that skills taxonomy ESCO in the hierarchy, the new hierarchy of the skills taxonomy. So this all is, is, is interesting that can, can be, uh, can, can give a lot of, of information and ideas to developers of learning outcomes and qualifications. So the question about how, how to include transversal skills in qualifications and, and occupational standards and qualification standards. Um, the, the, again, the question can be technical simply or uh, technical sociological. Um, uh, the, 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 as always, the employers, the world of work, um, the, the sectoral skills councils, committees, uh, professional associations, etc., they normally uh, have um, uh, analysis about skills on demand, right? Uh, they have nowadays many organizations, sectoral organizations, they have uh, small ob skills observatories. Uh, that kind kind of, for example, analyze even online job vacancies. Uh, what are the skills on demand um, in terms of digital skills? Uh, even now, the green skills, all the all the set of the transversal skills, life skills, etc. And so, it's quite important that developers of edu of education and training programs and developers of qualifications have the necessary dialogue and reference to these sources. So that's more or less, that's, that would be the technical aspect. So include information out of these observatories, analyses and trends in, 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 in skills uh, demand, demand for skills um, from the own uh, sectors, professional and, 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 and economic sectors or of course the, 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 the wider uh, labor market observatories. But <clears throat> there is also another aspect is, okay, in transversal skills and competences, uh, we often say um, include them, but how then to include them in the actual teaching process and the assessments, how to measure them. So that's another, uh, aspect, another interesting issue that needs to be considered and studied and analyzed. And um, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a global question because transversal skills are a global <laughs> need. They are quite similar across countries, uh, the, the demand. Um, and um, I want to ask you a, a, a question now. What do you think is the skill, the skill in highest demand across the European Union, 28 member states? Can you tell me just some ideas? It's a transversal, huh? it's a transversal. It's not a technical uh, skill. Uh, it's a transversal. And what is it? And this is based on analysis of online job vacancies, millions and millions for a period of three years. I will tell you, it is adapt to change. So employers in the European Union, so all these millions of online job vacancies put together, analyzed, that's the top skill, adapt to change. And then the other skills, the following are all transversal, or some of them are related with digital or language. It's communication, it's working teams, etc. So the question is, um, also, how to use all these sources of information, of uh, insights from the labor market of different regions and continents 
at national level as well. Because uh, the, those insights that are valid for the European Union, they are also quite similar in all other regions. So that's another maybe hint, uh, hint here or, or, or tip. Uh, use information uh, that, that this kind of very broad uh, information bro based on, 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 on large research permanent, constantly uh, updated and maintained. Uh, for for country at country level as well, it's it's a good orientation. The labor market does not change so much, and so the, the, the especially the transversal skills they are quite similar, common. Adapt to change, <laughs> quite amazing. Interesante, sí, adaptación al cambio y y bueno todo lo que has dicho tiene tiene mucho sentido para las discusiones que se dan aquí en la región. Estamos también en esta discusión de si las competencias transversales se pueden evaluar por separado de un contexto laboral, porque normalmente se dan en el contexto de un resultado observable. Tú trabajas en equipo para lograr un resultado, no solamente porque quieres trabajar en equipo. Eh, es, es eso. Pero muy bien, ahí nos has dado una muy buena cantidad de, de indicaciones Ahora también hay algún comentario sobre si hay alguna bibliografía de trayectorias ocupacionales, algún documento que conozcas que puedas, que puedas eh, también recomendar o donde se puedan consultar estas competencias transversales. Ya mencionaste que en la ESCO hay, hay bastante. De, de, sí, hay un, de sí, hay, sí, y hay también sí. un documento conceptual que, que es Excelente. muy interesante. Y, entonces, um, trayectorias ocupacionales uh, in English. So I, sí. I, I understand this as um, skills adjacency. So the skills that are necessary for uh, progression from one occupation to another, uh, whereby the in the second occupation, mm -hmm. you might need additional complementary skills, but those initial foundational skills are are used to to for for a progression throughout life at work for example there is uh, some interesting work being done um, and i can also send you some references um, but maybe the question is not exactly as i interpreted it now <clears throat> so what i i i i, I interpret trajectories uh, yeah. occupationales como Um, maybe occupational pathways. Mm -hmm. uh, occupational pathways, um, like yeah. in within within a, within, for example, a professional family. Um, yeah. So that uh, the, the 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 skills of of a worker an individual can be complemented, can be uh, can be uh, up, upgraded so that ah, okay. this person can have access to higher levels of a certain occupation to better pay yeah. better salaries mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. yes there is there is a there is a, a new work done on this exactly on this question based on data science uh, where different or the skills of different occupations have been analyzed and then those that are common as building block skills um, are then connected, and um, and this and, and this information also in in, in form of, of maps, uh, visual maps can can inform guidance, career guidance, and just uh, if, even in individual choices can also inform uh, training programs in companies. <clears throat> I can also send you this. Ah, gracias. Gracias, Eduarda. Apreciaremos mucho. Hay dos cosas para agregar a esa respuesta. Y, eh, en, eh, tenemos una experiencia muy interesante en Chile, que se, está también en, en varios sitios web, donde se ha trabajado el concepto de trayectoria formativo laboral, en la cual una persona puede moverse eh, en ocupaciones cada vez más complejas en un sector. Eh, hay algunos gráficos para el sector minero. Pueden entrar también quienes estén interesados y buscar marco de cualificaciones del sector minero en Chile. 
y lo van a ver. Eh, las, eh, también hay algún ejercicio de trayectorias ocupacionales que se hizo para el sector eh, de turismo en Chile sí. y también lo pueden encontrar. Pero este último concepto que agregaste, Eduarda, es muy interesante, que también se ha manejado como el concepto de la proximidad de ocupaciones. Y sí. hay mucho de data science ¿no? aplicado para saber, por ejemplo, una persona cuyo cargo queda obsoleto por un cambio tecnológico, qué habilidades tiene y hacia qué ocupación pueden ser transferidas esas habilidades. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Eh, eh, también quienes estén interesados, hay un observatorio de ocupaciones en Canadá sí. que tiene algún ejercicio desarrollado sobre, sobre ese tema. Es, es muy interesante. Por ahora son temas que se han conocido poco porque están basados, como tú lo dijiste, Eduarda, en lo que se conoce aquí muy rápidamente como Big Data, el análisis de grandes bases de datos. Y por ahora, hace una semana justo tuvimos una videoconferencia sobre un análisis de bases de datos para ver una taxonomía de perfiles a partir de, de una cantidad de ocupaciones, ¿no? Así que eso está creciendo mucho. Eh, también diría que en este momento ya estamos cerca de una hora y media y vamos a ver si tenemos alguna otra pregunta última. Eh, Sí, voy a, voy a compartir las, eh, esos sitios web de los observatorios. Quienes estén interesados en la página de OIT Interfor, hay un sitio que se llama Big Data y Brecha de Habilidades. Y ahí están muchas de estos eh, documentos que hemos mencionado. Y cuando Eduarda nos envíe aquel que mencionó, vamos a subirlo ahí también. Eh, te agradecemos mucho, Eduarda. Yo de mi parte les pediría que un minuto, la encuesta, un por favor. Ah, sí, adelante, Eduarda. Un minuto, un minuto Fernando, por favor. Por favor. Porque, Quería adelante, decir adelante. que eh, yo, yo, estoy, yo soy la coordinadora en ETF del proyecto Big Data for Labor Market Information, Big, Big, Big Data for Labor Market Intelligence. So, Uh, we can do also some uh, video conference or webinar about that. Um, and we have now already established um, big data systems based on online job vacancy analysis, of course, using artificial intelligence for the classification uh, for, uh, for three countries, now already a fourth country, Egypt. So the countries are Ukraine, Georgia, Tunisia, Egypt. We are also finishing Kenya. And then we are going to have more countries next year. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite interesting because we are using a very similar methodology as CDFOP for the EU member states for the 28. So UK is still part of that database. Um, and um, maybe we can talk about all the different things that can be done with these databases, including, nice. for example, now we are doing an additional new analysis, always using those millions of data um, on green skills and remote work. Um, Excellent. And yes, these, these, and these linkages, uh -huh. linking the dots through skills, it's really very, very interesting. We are also exploring, and I will finish, <laughs> uh, also uh -huh. besides demand analysis, there is also the possibility to use big data for supply analysis. So we are also now developing, elaborating a, a paper about use of big data sources for supply analysis and it will be uh, ready by end of the year and we will share. Excellent, Eduarda. Yeah. Estamos planificando el año que viene un curso de formación sobre elaboración de taxonomías y perfiles con el uso de big data. Ah, okay, okay. Desde ya, eh, desde ya acepto tu oferta para que podamos tener una videoconferencia tuya con esa experiencia. Muchísimas okay. gracias. Sí. Eh, Muchas gracias. Estamos con la encuesta de cierre del evento. Por favor, váyanla, váyanla colocando. Está ahí en línea para que nos dejen una, una, un feedback, una retroalimentación de cómo vieron este evento. Y yo creo que a esta altura me restaría... Simplemente, Eduarda, volver a enviarte un gran abrazo a la distancia. Espero que alguna vez podamos encontrarnos en algún evento presencial porque hay muchas cosas para compartir. Sí. Eh, viste que en el mejor momento tuvimos casi 80 personas conectadas. Eh, 
estuvieran muy interesados en estas cosas que están pasando en muchos países de nuestra región. Y de verdad que eh, agradecemos mucho. Liliana, que ha estado también muy pendiente del contacto contigo y con ETF, muchas gracias por seguir manejando este curso y, y esta dinámica. Y aquí, como verás, eh, tenemos personas que ya han participado en videoconferencias de Sinterfor. La, la, la totalidad de participantes que tenemos ya habían estado antes en alguna videoconferencia. Y como ves, eh, entre el puntaje más alto y el número cuatro, está calificado el evento. Así que muchísimas gracias a todos por, por, ese, por, ese gran, por esa gran calificación y a Eduarda también. Eh, nos quedaría entonces despedirnos y les estaremos informando de las nuevas videoconferencias. Tenemos una próxima, ¿no? Ya la, la semana que viene, donde vamos a ahondar más con una colega justamente de, de Eduarda allí de ETF, vamos a ahondar más en el tema del diseño curricular ¿no? eh, y de las cualificaciones, ¿no? el diseño curricular en un contexto de cualificaciones. Así que, bueno, seguiremos viéndonos. Eduarda, un buen resto de día, una tarde preciosa ya en, en Bruselas y a los demás en sus respectivos países. Muchas gracias a nuestro gracias. equipo técnico allí en Sinterfor, a Cecilia y a los colegas. Gracias por el apoyo. Y gracias. Nos... Muchas gracias a todos. Muy obrigada. Felicidades. Bueno, muy obrigado. Muchas gracias. Muito obrigada. Y... Muito obrigada. Gracias. Eduardo. Gracias. Obrigado. Chao. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias, gracias. Nos vemos. Vamos a hacer Big Data, Fernando. Vamos. Vamos sí. a hacer. Sí. Con certeza. Te voy a enviar la... También tenemos un, un curso de formación ahora. Seis ah, webinars. Te voy favor. a enviar el, el convite. Y vamos, vamos a combinar. Excelente. Sí, vamos Excelente, a combinar. Eduardo. Excelente, Obrigada. parabéns. Obrigado. Obrigado para você. Tchau. Muito gosto.